hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, uh, although we are in a crazy world with a lot of challenges, we have as well a lot of positive and hopeful things that we can actually go and do. Uh, uh, this uh, is one of the new series of interviews. This one with Mark um, Buckley, a person we deeply respect and as well that has a biography and, and the profile that speaks for itself. Um, so this is a series of interviews we're doing with citiesabc.com platform. So citiesabc is a platform to unite and uh, uh, make a collaboration marketplace and, and the ranking platform for cities worldwide, but as well creating a social impact movement that actually can create a Magna Carta for cities and for citizens worldwide. Um, we are conscious that in the times we're living, especially with coronavirus taking over the world and shifting all our social habits and different things, we need more than ever a message of hope, a narrative of hope. And that's the idea of this interview with Mark, that is uh, a person that has been uh, an activist and looking at some of the things, some keywords, futurist, um, advocate for United Nations social developing goals, um, a consultant and advisor, as well as a global food reformist that has a book coming, um, as well part of the World Economic Forum uh, network, and as well sustainable focus and futurist on that level. So the interview will be looking at the biography of Mark, will be around 40 minutes, and uh, we'll be tackling all these areas and the different things that we think are relevant about this. So, Mark, thank you to come on board and to be part of this group and as well to give us your time. It's an honor. Thank you for having me here. It's nice, Dennis, and uh, to everyone else. Thank you. Um, so to start, and I think I would like to start with the basics, <laughs> or the basics. So I think, could you give us a bit of uh, your life history, starting as a child and going to your Oh, education? boy. <laughs> not not all the details, but I think it's always good to go a bit how do you became who you are. I think it's very important. Well, that that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of big history myself. And so uh, my big history is one of uh, starting out as a global citizen. My father's American. My mother is German. My grandfather uh, was German and my grandmother was Austrian and Many aunts and uncles were mixed between Italy and France and Spain. And from a young age, I was already a global baby or a global citizen traveling around the world and learning different languages and speaking different languages and time spent between the US and uh, Europe mainly. I um, <clears throat> grew up half and half between the United States and uh, Europe, and mainly Southern Germany and Austria. Um, my uh, family were the owners of uh, six generations of Germany's largest organic farms and Europe's third largest organic farms. And uh, one of my aunts married a, a gentleman um, who had hydroponics uh, uh, agriculture in his, uh, his family of, of uh, three generations. And um, uh, when they passed on, one of my cousins took that over, but as a little, uh, not as a little, but as a young adult, I worked on uh, the nurseries and in the hydroponic farms, as well as the organic farms. I have uh, degrees from several universities Singularity, MIT, Lucerius Law School, uh, University of Phoenix, University of Utah, Salt Lake Community College, uh, Colorado, um, Rocky Mountain uh, Institute in uh, Denver, Colorado, and uh, probably a few that I'm forgetting. I'm an adjunct professor at several universities um, I work with the uh, Berlin School for Sustainable Futures, Potsdam Institute for Climate Change, also with um, the United Nations Sustainable De Development Solutions Network. With uh, I like to see that uh, you was on the call and he mentioned that he's alumni of Columbia. 
which is a Columbia University and Jeffrey Sachs, who runs that uh, organization for the UN. Um, and probably many others that I'm forgetting. I am um, um, currently living in Hamburg, Germany, but I, like I said, I'm a global citizen. I travel quite a bit, uh, do a lot of carbon offsetting and educating uh, organizations and international organizations around the world and do the innovation hub for uh, World Economic Forum as well as um, expert for climate change social innovation, innovation in agriculture, food and beverages. Um, and for the United Nations, I work on three different projects, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the uh, Resilience Frontiers, and the Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. It's a geospatial compilation of digital tools uh, for the Earth. Um, I've spoken at innovative conferences and emerging technology conferences and I'm a big global food reformist. Um, I've lived in many different countries and states throughout the years and owned 17 businesses myself and currently own four. Um, and uh, just so happy to be here. I, I know what one great thing is, is for me this uh, COVID is, um, very sad that uh, we're in this situation as a planet, but uh, for me, I'm busier than ever. I've been working in the future for well over 10 years. Uh, uh, not only the humans of new work, but how you do and conduct business on a global basis with family and businesses and partners around the world. And um, so besides not being able to travel on a plane and being confined not much in the day-to-day -day activities has truly changed because I've been using the tools and uh, been acting in the future and those leaders that I'm affiliated with and that I know their businesses are still opening and running and they're still uh, finding themselves in, in a position today to help others in need. They're providing respirators and uh, tools to make sure that our world continues to run and those people who are suffering and having tr struggles now, that they can get those tools and the help that they need. Um, it'd be nice to, for us to show the rest of the world how we can get them up to speed and live in the future because it can be really nice and it can be really resilient and secure to live in as well. Um, one last thing, is the big history of Mark is I was one of the first 50 people trained by Al Gore um, as a climate speaker in his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee. Um, I have mentors and friends like uh, William McDonough who wrote the book Upcycling and Cradle to Cradle with Michael Braumgart. Michael Braumgart lives here in Hamburg, Germany. And um, they're the front runners of the circular economy thought uh, process. Ellen MacArthur, Danes, and part of that as well. Um, and uh, Fritz Hof Capra, Professor Fritz Hof Capra, uh, who wrote the book, The Tao of Physics, and the book, The System's View of Life, uh, as a mentor and, a, and um, someone who I've attended his courses on the system's view of life and systems thinking and how by using systems thinking and emerging technologies, we can solve the global grand challenges of our future. And I think that's about it, unless you think there's something I missed. <laughs> no, it's, it's wonderful. And the, your your uh, biography is, uh, is amazing, and as well your work. So I would like to start with one question related with your work with the United Nations, specifically with the United Nations Sustainable Goals, which you, as well, we were writing and part of the, the people leading the process. So can you tell us... Let's start with that, because I think that's particularly important and is something that is on the epicenter of everything you're doing in your work uh, about sustainable goals and, this, and, and sustainability of development. So uh, can you get us a bit of overview? How do you see the United Nations Sustainable Goals and especially in our world that we have and as well your work uh, with the United Nations on that level? Sure. Um, so 
all 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are a people, planet, peace, protection plan. They're an insurance plan, not only goals, targets, and indicators to get us safely to 2030 to keep our planet below 1.5 degrees of warming, but they're all tied to agriculture, food, and beverages. More importantly than that, that I think most people kind of didn't understand or, or weren't aware of, is the, the world's first ever global moonshot. As people using emerging technologies as us, we deal a lot with futuristic thinking and innovations and, and dealing with how we get to the future. Well, I want you to know for the first time in our world's history, 193 countries came together for the first time ever, unheard of, unprecedented, and agreed on the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. You having been working along with the UN, being inside there, have seen that. It's hard enough for two countries to decide where they're gonna go to lunch, let alone 193 countries decide on a roadmap, an action plan, an insurance plan for our future of how we're gonna get there. And all agree that they're going to do it. That is the world's first ever global moonshot. It's a historical, unprecedented event. The time before the only moonshot that the world's ever done wasn't a world event that was by the US when John F. Kennedy set the mission for us to go to the moon. Now you can call this a moonshot or your earth shot or a planet shot, but it is an historical precedence. And it happened five years ago. Now we're five years and we're just starting to hit the exponential curve. We're just starting to get the ball rolling and understand how to look at them, how to view them. The Sustainable Development Goals, when they were launched, and I'm sorry, I have to apologize, they weren't presented to us in the proper way. They were colorful, laid out from one to 17, very linear and lateral. We didn't know, are they for companies? Are they for countries? Are they just colorful numbers? What do they mean? How do we apply them to ourselves? How do we understand them? Well, I'm telling you, they're all a system. They're all tied to food. And uh, when I tell people I'm an advocate for the SDGs, they're like, oh, great, I like number one. It's red, my favorite color. Um, no poverty. That's the one I work on. I say, great, that's fabulous. I'm so excited you've heard about them. But I want you to know it's virtually impossible for you to pick one sustainable development goal and work on that and not touch on the others because they're all tied together as a system. So if you were to pick number one, red, no poverty, it's virtually impossible not to touch on zero hunger, good health and well being, quality education, gender equality, life on land, life below water climate action, and sustainable uh, or uh, clean water and sanitation. It's impossible because they're all tied together in a system and many more. So there's, um, like I said, all 17 are tied to agriculture, food, and beverages, which is the lifeblood and energy of every human being on earth. And for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, I wrote the manifesto. And the reason I wrote the manifesto is, uh, one, because a lot of people hadn't heard of it, they didn't know how to look at them, but I wanted people to get a vision, a feeling, a hope, something that if they closed their eyes or thought about when they read the manifesto or when it was heard, that they could envision what a future would look like by 2030, what that world would feel and look like if they reached that and what kind of benefits it would bring them because without that vision, that uh, medium, that understanding of what our, our future could look like if we reach the goals, then it's kind of hopeless. And most of the, the views, especially today, are very dystopian. We don't have very good media that shows us a nice, beautiful future, something to engineer, to architect, to create, design, or build for a, a, as a coder. Um, something that we can reach in the future. And I think that narrative and those stories really need to change to something more positive that give us all a, a vision. Um, I sent you a couple copies of 
of the manifesto and I, I normally would read it to you so that you can see that but maybe you can release that with a, with a video or, or later but I thought I would tell you that's kind of uh, the work that I do there with the United Nations around the SDGs but then I'm also working on the digital ecosystem for the earth it's a compilation of geospatial data areas and infrastructure and governance around around that with uh, a lot of UN interagencies, a few World Economic Forum agencies, Microsoft and, and uh, the geospatial area from Google, and many others are constantly coming on board every day to bring that together in a form of distributed ledger technology and, and emerging technologies as one source, as a collective that's decentralized for everybody to use and secure and have some governance to it. And then the other one is one uh, project that I started in last year in February in Songdo, Korea. It's called Resilience Frontiers. It's the step and iterations what happens after 2030. So from 2030 to 2050. After that point in time, we're going to have to have other goals and a roadmap and a vision in that vision is really strongly based on emerging technologies and resilience and that's why it's called resilience frontiers and um, uh, cop 25 in, in um, madrid last year in december um, we we launched as the un we launched the uh, resiliency lab or resilience lab um, and had done the turnover to the interagencies but the thought process, the modeling, and the projecting that we did for this uh, roadmap from 2030 to 2050 is based on U UNESCO and the UN's uh, foresight modeling, the backcasting that was used in, in the Sustainable Development Goals, and also a real moonshot type of a, a framework. So how can we make sure that we have a resilient, desirable, sustainable futures for us all to live in um, going forward. And so those are three projects and I'm ex extremely excited about and I could probably do thousands of other projects, but I'm only one octopus that can uh, do so much. But, but I believe in that systems view of life that in order to solve global grand challenges of the future, we need to address many different facets and apply many different technologies that all work together in harmony as a system in order to solve those global grand challenges. I, I believe and know that is truly the way. And in 2018, all international organizations, the UN, the World Economic Forum, World Trade Organization, WHO, all switched to systems dynamic modeling, transformational maps on their websites, on the SDG interlinkages and many others this way of systems thinking to solve global grand challenges because they realized that that linear, lateral, siloed approach at solving grand challenges wasn't working anymore. And that's why I truly like what I see so far about Cities ABC is that it's really got systems thinking behind it. It's dynamic, it's very integral where you can create several types of scenarios, get the data and the input uh, find what you need to get that complexity that we need to truly understand the problem, but also then to, to apply and use those solutions to solve the problem. So as you can tell, I can talk for hours, but I think off of that one question, I hope I've answered it properly. No, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and, and so picking on that level, so I think... Um, especially you are a futurist as well, and you've been looking at present and future. So how do you see, and, and probably looking at the bridge, because of course we have right now um, a substantial issue related with geopolitics. Of course, right now as well, uh, uh, we have the alarming numbers of what is happening with coronavirus. And of course, there's, there's people like us that are trying to um, come up with a better narrative. I think the narrative is critical. But the challenge is how do you take, <coughs> for instance, I had a meeting previously to this one, where we were talking actually with a partner of ours, and he was saying that uh, most of the people, and I think if you see the US uh, government, this, the perception of the general population is like the, 
the how you put it this in a sensitive way it's like they understand the language of 14 years old okay so the challenge is that uh, what i've been finding right now and i think probably you have the same perception work with governments and, and uh, with a lot of complex problems is that we have the complexity of the all these solutions that we're building and mm -hmm. uh, and as well coming up with something that can actually create change but then we have the general perception of people that is like a 14 years old capacity of digesting data and different things and actually to be honest if you look at pure data digital transformation capacity we are probably only five percent of our population have that capacity so from the problem and this is the problem because we this is creating a huge uh, dimension right now for instance if you look at the, the growth of the the economical issues that are coming out of uh, coronavirus especially if you look at the world economy def deficit which is around between 275 trillion dollars to 300 trillion dollars and then the world economy is around 80 trillion dollars and then the last couple of weeks we have uh, uh, incentives of around 15 10 to 15 trillion dollars being put in the economy but then we have this that for instance I just received a, a PR from the Chamber of Commerce of the US that one in five business will close in the US so how do you see this kind of um, fantastic goals that we are all talking about to really making it happen? Because I think the problem right now is that if we don't really make this happen, we might get the order for tourist very dystopic world. So I would like to have your view because I think you're doing more than most of the people in the planet. But right now is how we go from this kind of helicopter view to make change. Because that's the challenge is, is that change is still not happening. And uh, although, like you said, there's a lot of positive things happening, at the moment what people seeing is panicking and, of course, losing jobs. And, of course, I'm not even talking in emerging markets, for instance, it's the, with this, where the situation is much more alarming. So how do you see that from your experience in different angles? So I'd like to take the overview perspective or this cosmic perspective that you mentioned in the helicopter perspective, but I, I really believe that the solutions come from the bottom up from those who are suffering the most uh, at the bottom layers. And so now we've, we've got them and put them in a, in a situation where they don't have a resilient infrastructure. And now where our healthcare systems around the world globally and our infrastructures are not very resilient, we have a pandemic like this come or the SARS or any other one that we've seen in the past and instead of just a hiccup it turns into a pandemic and it turns into something very serious and uh, by no means uh, do we want not want to take it serious and uh, not have uh, the due respect for the people who are impacted and being affected by this but I can also tell you that if the infrastructure of our world was resilient and if people had good health and quality uh, education and well-being if they didn't have exorbitant pandemic numbers of obesity pandemic numbers of asthma pandemic numbers of diabetes if their health wasn't already at a suppressed or their immune system wasn't already doing bad then when something like this comes they would be more resilient. They would be able to bounce back. And secondly, if the infrastructures of our hospitals and our cities were more so of that of the future, prepared with enough supplies, with enough uh, renewable energy and sustainability in place, then that's the ticket right there. That's the key of, of making it through something like this. And so, I, I want to give you an example, and I, I, I mean it with all due respect. Those people who are futurists, those people who are leaders, those people who are, are still operating and functioning today, those are also the people that we know of that have been working in the future for a long time. And they are the ones who are helping us worldwide with not only monies, but with digitization and respirators, I mean, Elon Musk gave the FDA approved respirators. He makes electrical vehicles and is going to space. Why is he doing respirators? Well, 
because he's a leader, he's a futurist, and he, want, he cares deeply about humanity, and he wants to help in a time of crisis. And he knows that on a dime, the world's industry can be changed and turned to be used to create resilient infrastructures, to jump into place, to create masks and respirators, and those things are needs. But who are those people? Those are entrepreneurs and futurists who've been working that way for years that have different business models working towards the future. Now, those businesses that are probably going to go out of business and not exist according to this U.S. structure, I don't know who they are. I don't know if they're needed. I, I do know because I come from global food reformists and I'm a food activist that in the food industry, the farmers and the servers of food and those, those businesses, they've been affected. It's unbelievable. They're closed. They're, they're delivering meals uh, and doing all sorts of stuff. They've been hugely affected. But I want you to, to know that they can have a job, they can have the basic benefits and the needs that they, that they require if for one problem that we've had for a long time, the agriculture, food and beverage industry is 12,000 years old. It's the world's oldest, longest, most successful economy in the world. It's our basic energy source and I want you to know that in the last 200, 250 years of the industrial revolution, we've seen six innovations in the agriculture, food and beverage industry. And now I want you to tell me when a pandemic or crisis or that resilience infrastructure is needed in a time of need, where is it? What's happened? Well, we, we, we don't have the innovations. We don't have the technology. We're not running on blockchain and distributed ledger technology to have food security and to know logistic chains and, and all those things that are so needed. And uh, now we're panicking about those people. Now is a time with the COVID to take a pause and not go back to an old economic model or to old systems and do bailouts that are proven not to work or just to create another bubble that's going to pop. I think it's, it's important we keep our economy afloat long enough to transit, transition and to do a reset to something that will work globally for everyone, that it will ensure basic needs and resilient infrastructure. That is truly the key. And uh, to bring in some of these much needed innovations and securities for um, the agriculture, food and beverage industry that is desperately in need and, and the city's infrastructural needs. Uh, most cities that we're talking about in cities ABC and in the world, they were all built up and founded on, on a basic principle. They were started with agriculture, food and beverages and farming and the food was in the middle of those city centers and built up around it. Today, we've pushed all of that to the outskirts and to the industrial area making it difficult for those processes to come inside. And we need to really merge those two worlds together and create some uh, resilient infrastructure so that when this comes again, and it will, we'll see other pandemics and other issues arise, that we have a resilient infrastructure based upon clean tech and emerging technologies that we will still be able to have energy, food, water, and the basics that we need to survive tomorrow, that we're not miserable because we've been locked up in our house with our loved ones, that we're happy as heck because we're operating differently. We're working and thinking and acting in the future and in the future we want to live in. We're not stressing about the basics. And um, that big problem really, uh, there's no big finger to point to anybody, but it is, uh, it is the governments of the world that are poorly prepared and uh, they now can greatly look to our entrepreneurs and those innovators of the world because I believe we have the solutions and we can help you ramp up just like Elon Musk helped uh, Australia with their battery powers and, and many others have helped in the past. Uh, uh, the biggest contributor to the UN is Bill, Ga Bill Gates, by the way, and he does wonderful things 
Um, and so uh, I, I really think those are some key messages of hope and we will get through this and uh, uh, we will get you some better food and some better health and infrastructure in the future so that you can really live in the future in a different way. That be hopeful, be optimistic, don't be depressed or worried. We're gonna give you some images of hope and uh, this is still the decade of action. We're gonna achieve the sustainable development goals and this year took off on an exponential roadmap already with trillions coming online to, to meet the numbers and the, the financials that you, you spoke about in the beginning of my question that you just asked me is, where does that money come from? How do we do that ramp up? Well, for every um, monies that are invested towards sustainable development goals, towards sustainable development and resilience, there is an exorbitant return. We need to reach the goals by 2030, 94 trillion US dollars. That's a little bit more than $6 trillion a year. And um, we're a little bit behind, but I can tell you, regardless, business as usual by 2030, if we just continue on the same path we are, and we have hiccups and problems and we just when a building gets dilapidated, we tear it down and rebuild it with a high carbon scenario with fossil fuels. Regardless, by 2030, we're gonna spend 89 trillion US dollars. But to have a sustainable future and do it in a sustainable development way or a low carbon scenario will cost us 95 trillion US dollars. And every business, and Unilever was one of the first to come out with this, but um, there are numerous businesses that have now come on board and applied the sustainable development goals, the targets, the indicators, and that thinking into their business models, into their reporting, and into their actions, more importantly. And those companies that have done it are saying there's a 12 trillion US dollar return every single year. That's more than $6 trillion needed to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030 but there's all sorts of benefits. And I've heard numbers way up into uh, 24 trillion US dollars, 48 trillion US dollars. It depends on the different sources and where they come from. And there's numerous examples out there. I just spoke about SDG and your business models and reporting to the GRI and the ISO about uh, um, your sustainability in, in your company. And there are so many benefits because it's a better business model. It's a more efficient model. Um, and the example that I've given you a couple of times now, if you look at Elon Musk, his gigafactory is still running. Why? Because it's automated, it's mechanized, it's digitized. And the distance between his employees, besides in the engineering office or maybe administration, is more than two meters distance because they're running and programming robots. They're doing things that are worthy and intelligent of somebody who's building batteries and cars. And he's our, he not only he, but his employees are working in the future. They're still working and, and the majority of that's automated. Jeff Bezos, Amazon, most of those are chaotic warehousing with robots picking and packing packages and things out, putting it in, into a box. And if that is done, those people are still working. And then they hand it to the delivery driver who's one driver with a mask and gloves and still dr delivers the product. We need to think differently. How can we work in the future? How can we change the models so that, because our world has got to continue to function, but it has to continue in not a dystopian way, but in a resilient, desirable future and one that works for us all. So uh, Mark has a question on food, but I just want, uh, probably it's a bigger question. So Mark, get to your question, because I have a bigger question on that level, because I think my points, and before we go to the food part, because it's a very specific part that I, I completely agree with you. So my question, and then we pass to Mar uh, Matt's food question, is, so if you look at history, okay, um, and I think, uh, like you said, there's a lot of positive examples, but we have a massive perception issue in the world economy and the world society okay and until we did not solve that perception issue we're going to start having this geopolitical increasing meltdown 
and as well at the moment we have not just the, the geopolitical meltdown we have a, a disparity of popular populism governments and some of them with very bad principles and we have as well kind of a chaos and actually right now a panic in the world economy and the world society so if you look at history probably the element i would say that uh, if you look at the the achievements of um, looking at professor Harari and a lot of studies uh, uh, historians if you look at uh, when we have a big acceleration of technology or development normally it comes with a um, a period of less development and normally with retrocess okay you saw that for instance with the Recess, roman yeah. empire uh, when they advance massive and suddenly the Roman Empire just melt down completely. Um, and then we went to the kind of the Middle Age, which were initially the Dark Age, but it actually was not so dark, thankfully. And it was as well from the Middle Age, we got kind of the inception of the city-states, which run most of the first 500 years of the beginning of yeah, the, the probably, actually the, one, the first 1,500 years of the, the the Christian era that we're living, were actually partly uh, city states that emerged, and then after the Renaissance, we 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 got states that start taking over. So, I'll, and as well, a lot of the cities have their own sustainable uh, agriculture and as well food chains. They were very. They had wonderful infrastructures and very technologically advanced, so to say, with with their infrastructure, their way of thinking, the way of logistics, and the way the cities were set up. I totally agree with you. One thing that most people forget about, so we hear a lot about the hominids or the hominin, uh, the, the eight other close relatives of Homo sapien, like Homo erectus, Homo neanderthals, that are no longer here before. And why aren't they here? Because they are our closest relatives that had language and, and and tools and, and had family structures and, and uh, traveled together and lived together. Why aren't they here? But one thing that we don't hear about is what about those well over 12 ancient civilizations, civilization frameworks and structures. You mentioned on one, the Roman Empire, early Mesopotamia, early antiquity, the Greeks, the Aztecs, Mayas, Incas, the Roman Empire, Greek Empire, the Chinese Empire, and I could go on they don't exist anymore. They're not here. And I'm not talking uh, that far back. The, it wasn't that far back and they're not here anymore. Um, there's nothing left but ruins of those civilizations that we go and take a selfie with on, on, on vacation. But what does that history tell us? Those more than 12 civilizations that no longer exist here all but two had a complete compl collapse because of ecological or environmental problems, because of infrastructural problems. The other ones, they're saying that it could have been a conflict between cultures, and, and, um, and that's why they don't exist. But now we're in a global world, and just because we have great technology and uh, we're, we're global, we could face a collapse. I mean, COVID's showing us how quickly things can slow down and shut down and affect us all, not only financially, but period. And so we really need that big history lesson. We really need to think differently. We need to think how those stories of our past aren't being rep repeated in the future. And so I say something often, the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different solution or, or that you'll come up with something different. It's actually Einstein's problem theory. The thing is, is we're, I'm kind of not worried, but I'm kind of not too excited to hear that the U.S. is going to print more money and do another bailout, basically. I think it's much needed. I, I believe we need to keep our economies afloat, make sure people don't die and get hurt, but we don't want to go back to that old system. We want to reset for something new using emerging technologies. And I mentioned this to you yesterday, and it's very applicable that hopefully people will get this in their minds uh, because I, I spoke briefly about moonshots. 
Buzz Aldrin was the pilot, the captain that flew the Apollo mission to the moon and safely brought it back. While he was there, he got some moon rock. And when he came back and safely landed on Earth, he used the latest emerging technologies and computing power to get safely there and back going to the bathroom in a suit, breathing in space, living in the, the cold, dark depths of space, and he made it back safe. And then he had to fill out a handwritten, typed paper customs declaration for his moon rock. Then he had to pay, fill out a handwritten, typed, and signed travel voucher to be paid. The guy just used the latest emerging technologies, computing power to get there and come back safely, do something that is an incredible world feat, and now he goes to an analog system that doesn't communicate with the rest of the world or anything else for customs and that. That's the same thing we're experiencing today. We're not in the digital revolution. We're not up to speed with our exponentially growing world, and we need those two systems to communicate to each other so we can solve global problems and quit going back to old systems that don't work that have been proven time and time to burst and not function. And, that, and that's exactly what you, Cities ABC, is doing and many others who are using emerging technologies. They're thinking what global systems that are decentralized, secure, trustless systems that you don't have to say, oh, do I trust Mark before I use his system? No, this is a trustless system that is secure, that will lead us into the future of how we can solve these problems and still quit wasting time and say, oh, well, is, the, is this the right system? Is that the right bank to go to? Is that, you know, that doesn't work. That's not working for humanity and the current civilization framework, the global framework that we're in is not working for humanity anymore. And that's why we see this disruption, this feeling of collapse, this feeling of worry because people don't know what the future feels like or what it looks like. They don't see the leaders of uh, nations emerging to guide us through this safely. Yeah, I completely. So Mark, Matt, you have a question on food and yeah. I think that's a very important thing. It was, uh, it, was, it was kind of on one of your first ones, but uh, for the resilient infrastructure for cities, especially in the food aspect, you see that becoming kind of a hyper-local um, aspect where you have community gardens, where you have the, let's say the um, uh, gardens on top of the the food safety on top of the buildings, where you can have you know drones and hydroponic systems. Do you see that becoming more of a hyper local resilient framework for the food security of cities? I think that's one tool. Thanks for your question, Matt. I think that's one tool uh, or facet in in our toolbox. I. I believe there are so many options available for cities. So there's controlled environmental agriculture that we could put into buildings, skyscrapers, parking garages, um, spaces within cities where it's a closed system that works on hydroponics without soil and artificial lights, so LED lights, and they use a nutrient film technology that's organic to create food. Um, but I think we need to take it a step further. So that's, that's one tool. There's also aquaponics. There's also um, rooftop gardens. There's green rooftops. There's solar rooftops. I believe that um, our biggest need as human beings, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is breathing food and water. And so we need to always make sure that where we live, food is close by. And that needs to be an inter integral part uh, of cities and communities, there is a way if you live in an apartment to bring that into your house. You can do sprouting, you can have a vertical garden refrigerator or kind of like, a, it looks like a wine cabinet or a larger refrigerator where you can have a larger vertical farm for, for a family in your house. You could have an ambient water harvester in, in your kitchen that's about the size of, of a coffee machine that that pulls about five liters of ambient water out of the air each day, filters that with very little electrical need. You could have battery backup and a solar panel and a power wall in your house or whoever it comes from in your house or your apartment to kind of be this self-sustaining off the grid until your city 
gets up to speed with the infrastructure that we all need. Um, uh, so there's ways to do it at many different levels and many different facets to bring in, bring that back into the cities. And what it does is it creates resilient, desirable infrastructures for cities, a solid foundation. When problems occur, oh, it's okay. We have a great water management system. It's okay. We have a great renewable system. We have great battery backup. And we're producing food locally here uh, that's healthy enough to, to sustain us in these times of hard need. We don't, we don't have that currently. We, we see pockets of it around the world and some great leaders. Uh, matter of fact, Elon Musk's uh, brother, Kimball Musk, um, is um, doing great with square roots and the kitchen. He's delivering tons of meals during this time and he has these shipping containers that he's converted into uh, these vertical farms and, and delivering food. So that is really important that we rethink how do we bring that back into the cities and create those. And there's numerous companies and innovators out there doing that. We just need to start applying. And it's not about who has the best system and how we're competing against each other as entrepreneurs. It's about how are we creating that infrastructure for the future of where we really need to be so that when, when times occur, it's going to be okay. We've got a garden on the roof. We've got a garden in our neighbor's house, or we've got a, a, a closed system garden here. We're going to have food. We've got good water management system. We're going to be okay. So, so coming on that, and I think uh, as well, you're writing a book about uh, food infrastructure and a lot of these areas, uh, global food reform. So yeah, I think th this touch, yeah. So this touch exactly for me the most important thing is because I think we are all all in this call. We are all thought leaders and, and academics and people that are trying to change the world, but. The challenge is that the world is, although we have fantastic examples, there's still a lot of things. So how can we, so picking your book and this part of the infrastructure, and you mentioned some things, so how can we go deeper? And I think we, we have probably one more question after this, but this is very important. Now, can we go deeper with concrete things? And I think like step by step, and I think uh, uh, even the people that are listening to us, which I think our videos are reaching a couple of thousands of people, how can we act now everyone is at home we can, I think I know that most of people are just panicking, but we need to create the narrative on that. And, and this is very important from your book and the infrastructure and the action. So uh, my, many years ago, I have a background, a medical background, and um, there is this um, great analogy I like to use, and it has to do with Spider-Man. So when Spider-Man comes upon a scene of an emergency or a problem, the first thing he does is he kind of stands back and he puts his hands up and he kind of looks and he lets his spidey sense, these radar, this, he pauses and he looks and he assesses the situation so that he's not running into a burning building or into something where, you know, there's some kind of a chemical or disaster that kills him. He stopped and paused and assessed the system. And um, then after he knows what's going on, he's go he goes in there and solves it. And so I think that really right now, we need to take a point in time to, to discern from all the fake news and all the panic and the fear. We need to understand the big history of our world uh, which we've touched upon here, that we really understand the big history of what this journey is that we're going on as humanity and where is it leading? What is the current path that the future from Trump or Bolsonaro or Shea or whoever the, the world leader is, what does that path, where is that going to lead us to in five and ten years when, when we reach reach what they're talking about? Or is it a path that's so uncertain you just don't know. And understand that big history and then take this time as a pause to understand how we got here. So a lot of people don't even know about the, the COVID and, and what it is and how we got here and how it happened. Uh, cities, agriculture, and people, are they're saying, played a big part in this and they think that in Wuhan or 
Wuhan, or however you say the province or, or the place in, in China, they think it was a wet market with uh, maybe a bat that came into the wet market that was sold in, to food. Um, and somehow either through pets or bats or food or people feeding that to them, that's how it started. But it has nothing to do with China. That's just a wet market where it occurred. What it has to do is much before that, where we're encroaching on environmental spaces where different types of species and animals besides human beings used to live that have viruses and bacteria that affect our world. And uh, now, because we weren't prepared enough, and because our health of a lot of our global citizens isn't that one that can bounce back quickly uh, because of infrastructures, because of the way our food and, and health care goes, um, we've not, we're now faced with this. And so what we need to do is not go back to an old system, take this time to pause and reset be very positive about working in the future, what the future of work and life looks like, but also push forward, forward the clean tech revolution, emerging technologies and how we reach the future to create this resilient, desirable infrastructure. Solid infrastructure that works for everybody on the planet where basic needs and resources are covered and secure so that when this happens again, We'll say it's a hiccup. It's something that didn't affect us because we were prepared. We were prepared and we, we listened and we, we're going to make sure because it's really about the future, our future, our children's future and future generations uh, to be able to, to produce those resources, to produce products in the future, to pay your people in the future, to have the type of work that's going to be around in these situations. No, completely. So, so probably one of, I don't know if Professor you or Matt have more questions. I have just one, probably the last one. We are in 45 minutes, so probably we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here, but the people will be able to see more about you. So my last question, if Matt and you have some questions as well. My last question is, so looking at um, the people that are looking at us right now and listen to this, how do you suggest like uh, especially for the peer-to-peer -peer, because you are part of global networks and all of us and as well the platform cities abc is precisely to to create a movement that anyone can use at least to get the data owning the data and get more resources and eventually in the near future to be part of a marketplace but how do you suggest uh, movements or uh, places where people actually can get information and can get involved because i think that's the, right now people are all at home and they could use their time and their space to start doing something. Of course, at least the people that are listening to us and they will listen to us, but as well, creating a bit of a movement out of this and a bit more positive movement to pick what you say from the theory to the practice, at least for people that are not part of these movements that we are part of. When you're trapped at home, it's hard to see anything besides your four walls. Um, uh, hopefully you're there with, with uh, loved ones and, and people that you can speak to and collaborate with and, and be pulled out of any feelings of despair or loneliness. I really believe that uh, we take this time as a pause, as a time to rest, to rethink, to re-educate ourselves of what the situation we personally all are faced with and where we live and what um, the, our future would have been like had there been no COVID? What was the path that we're going on? Would, if in the future we had a COVID incident, would we be in the same situation? Or could there have been things that we could do now or could have done to make sure that this time is a beautiful time, one of growth and learning, of continuing to work and continuing to take care of our loved ones and to be in a situation the the best situation you can ever be in, in in any crisis is one where you're helping people to be better, helping people to get out of any problem that they're feeling out. What I've been doing my whole life since I started this journey 
is to solve global grand challenges, to make sure that we don't have that suffering in the future, to follow the golden rule, to treat people and planet how we want to be treated. And so make sure that you have knowledge about the emerging technologies, that you have a resilient infrastructure in your life, whether it's your home, your apartment, your community, that you know where to get those resources to sustain yourself for that time, that you're well aware of the spots that you need to go to online and offline for help and resources, but more so that you put yourself in the future in, in a position that when a time comes that you have your own bank account, your own savings account, your own energy account that you can give back and help humanity and that you have enough to resiliently make it through until tomorrow to have enough food, water, and energy and resources for yourself. Now, Cities ABC is a portal where I, I would suggest not only cities can go to and individuals can go to for data, information, and knowledge to get this awareness, but I would, I would like to push governments and city leaders to use this tool to get in there and use it and update it to, to support it with data to um, use it for a tool to make their cities resilient and prepared for the future. And not just to go back to an old system and uh, say, we, you know, okay, we've got through this, we've done it, and now we're just going to go back to the old system and wait till something happens again. We, ne we need something new. We need something resilient and desirable. And that's in the beginning of this conversation, some of the things I'm working on, but it's not enough if I work on it or others work on it. We all need to work on it together and get on the same page of where we want to be in in the future. And I think the, the best goals and guidelines of that are the sustainable development goals. If you read the manifesto or if you understand what that world could look like by 2030, it's a pretty good foundation of equality and gender equality and good equality education, health and well-being, no hunger, no poverty, and resources that we need to live and function that now we can springboard off into the emerging technologies that we truly need to, to build stable resilience globally for us all. I, I just, don't know. I hope, I hope that helped. No, I no, mean, no. It's, uh, that it's was a, you can, I can tell you it wasn't an easy question. No, no, I understand. I that could nothing. answer it all day long with many <laughs> different facets, but it was a difficult one. Uh, I appreciate it and it's, uh, it's very inspirational. So uh, I think to wrap up because of course uh, we have 45 minutes of interview. So can you tell us where people can find you? I know that you're very present in social media, but the channels and as well that they can read your books and your different things. Of course, we will put all the links in the interview, but I think it's important to hear from you and we'll wrap up. Yeah, that. you can go to Mark, M-A-R-C Buckley, B-U-C-K-L-E-Y -E mm -hmm. dot earth. Um, uh, markbuckley.earth there's a lot of information there and ways to contact me and to reach me there and I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and many other places you can search and just you could type in Mark Buckley and I'm sure the you'll you'll see and find a plethora of things and information if you want to get a hold of me or ask a question or just reach out to me on one of the social medias I don't know where you're going to post this and uh, ask your question there and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so yeah. those, those are all the places. Yeah, could I ask um, for the Cities ABC project, uh, would you suggest that maybe we can work on some model that will create some index purely for the COVID-19? Uh, because uh, as you already mentioned that uh, we already discussed, uh, now the business world is in disorder and uh, especially when recently helping the UK National health service to uh, for some of their emergent uh, staff material supply. I found that the whole market uh, broken. Okay, uh, actually yesterday I, I'm talking to the the commissioner, uh, British Ambassador Beijing, which is a deputy ambassador, uh, John Edward, and uh, he also recognized it's broken market because the business rules seems not apply, and the people who need the equipment they cannot the end users the hospital could not get them, but. Uh, the business people in the middle 
okay, unethically, they keep them and uh, to waiting for the price to increase. And uh, all this create a big problem. The people die every day, hundreds of them, but uh, the business people, they trying to make huge money and waiting to the best time to sell them because, you know, it's very difficult to ramp up uh, medical equipment uh, immediately, right, so in yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, so we maybe, I just think if you could uh, uh, working with us or you could uh, uh, use our platform to publish some like uh, 17 SDGs for COVID business uh, uh, practice or, or other things, I think that would be maybe very uh, useful, uh, valuable yeah, to the society. That's, that is a sustainable society itself of this. Yeah, that's just some of my own idea. Yeah, I think I think that's a step in the right direction, and I'd be glad to contribute and help. One thing where I can see this a tool, uh, and I've run across this in questions in the last few weeks, is people have supplies, they have things that they want to donate or sell, or they want to get out there to help, and then they spend hours emailing and calling a number that's never answered an email that's never answered to no. trying to find out where they can go to give some help. And mm -hmm. so it would be nice not only to have ABC uh, Cities ABC be a platform where, okay, well, here's where the resources are. Here's where the people, this people person wants to help. And uh, where do I go and how do I do that? How do they turn that in and connect those, those people? Because if you lose them in that initial process, when they're ready to help or when they have a product and it takes them two days a week to get just to get in touch with somebody and then it's the wrong person it's done it's over people will have died and that is part of this infrastructure that we're talking about this infrastructure that we need to change we need something that is trustless decentralized an emerging technology like blockchain or distributed ledger technology that automates that and uh it's again that's buzz aldrin thing is these two worlds aren't speaking to each other and that's when we have a huge breakdown uh, a, a huge breakdown and so if we could use uh, cities abc for that man that would just be fabulous and, and to have it be peer-to-peer -peer, peer or open source or people say this is exactly where I could go. I live in London. This is where I'm going to go. This is what I have. I'm looking for this. Here's the situation. Let's get it resolved. Because there are infrastructures, there are systems and tools in place from governments around the world, but none of them are really speaking good to each other. None of them are really working at the best, most efficient level. And mm -hmm. we need to change that. We kind of need mm -hmm. to get away from that and have something that's more um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. a trustless thing. Thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I agree that the blockchain is a technology to regulate this disordered business world at the current uh, situation. And the uh, and use blockchain, I, I, I was discussing with some uh, senior business leaders in China yesterday and uh, to say that uh, because uh, this disorder is caused by the uh, misinformation uh, spread online. For example, some people, they may not have such e enough for uh, equipment, medical equipment, but they, they claim they have it, okay? So uh, for the manufacturer, for example, they only produce 100 pieces of this uh, ventilator, but uh, the people, the agent, they all claim they have 100, so they make up 10,000, you know? So mm -hmm. the information, who actually have what? So this should be on blockchain. It's not on their papers, on their uh, word mm -hmm. of mouth, you know? So, but of course, this thing, I think really we need the technology working with the government, uh, inquire all the medicine, medical uh, uh, manufacturer or, or providers, they should uh, uh, apply this technology, okay. I think Thank there's you. a lot of people out there who are working on that and there's currently tons of hackathons going on where people are trying to come up with systems. I keep seeing Matt smile because I think he's, he's probably a coder or a hacker and he knows uh, on He's how much this, this is needing yeah. and probably can do some of the programming for us. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> no, I'm not, I'm not the coder, I'm the evangelist. Um, okay. We're aware of a lot of the resilient uh, blockchain-based infrastructure that's being built uh, to hack at uh, COVID 
um, one specific one is a really good application that I'll just mention here. Um, Tony Rose is building a self-sovereign identity uh, system so that you can have, when you test yourself, you can do it on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, ensure that you know you're COVID free so you can go into uh, nursing homes or go visit your grandmother or go into public infrastructure. Um, so there's a self-sovereign identity way of ensuring that your health records are, are, are um, secure and that you can verify that you're free of the, uh, of the virus whenever you think. So that, that's one that I was thinking of going, oh, that's just perfect. Um, that's fabulous. That's great to hear. And I, I've heard of several others like that as well. So, I mean, IOTA is working on, on uh, or IOTA, I don't know how you say it, probably IOTA, yeah, IOTA yeah. is yeah. working on some stuff. And there's there's numerous others. I, Odyssey Connect is actually my call next that I they have. It's a, a big hackathon with uh, trying to solve global grand challenges, all using emerging technologies, AI, blockchain, future technologies, um, and the oceans protocol, nature 2.0, things like that, to come together to get us to all, to, to all solve these global grand challenges. And so for some people, we're speaking uh, um, a foreign language when, when we talk about tech like that, but our world, I just want you to know, our world is growing exponentially around us, good, bad, and ugly. And we need those two worlds to speak to each other, to understand each other, whether we get it or not. We need some kind of added layer of help as human beings to keep us up to speed with our exponentially growing world, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We need to keep up to pace with that because if we don't, the problems that we experience is the calamities and those things are going to be so distant that, that we're going to, we're running into the problems now. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to work in the future, the clean tech revolution into the emerging technologies, the future of work, one that is not dystopian. It's a beautiful world that's resilient and desirable that, we can all enjoy each other, the world, and enough resources and abundance for us all. This is the greatest uh, decentralized collaborative effort humanity has ever uh, taken upon. This is this is the one of the first moonshots of the of the twenty twenties is Great. to tackle this virus program together. Um, yeah. So the greatest decentralized collaborative effort ever existing in humanity, and we're a part of it. I love it. And you need to lead it. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been an honor and privilege, and I think there's a lot of ideas. So um, I know that you have your book coming soon. The interview, we're going to put your bio and link to all your websites. We appreciate your time and the initiative, and as well, your positive message and activism. Yeah, the, Thank you so the, much. The book's called Menu B. It's put out by 1.5 Media Publishing, and they are also uh, the publishers of Innovators Magazine. That's a place that you guys can go to to get free publicity and help on uh, not only hacking global grand challenges in the COVID, but also to promote Cities ABC. Uh, Susan and Ian Robertson would love to hear from you and um, promote you guys and also um, see that Cities uh, ABC comes to fruition. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.